Hola, buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Eh, bueno, ya han visto que hoy no, que hoy no hay ponente. Eh, hoy tenemos un, un ponente virtual. Yo creo que en alguna, en alguna ocasión Paloma Larco ya les anunció que el profesor Richard Bretel estaba enfermo y que era probable que no, que no pudiera venir a su conferencia. Efectivamente, está, en, está ahora mismo sometido a un tratamiento y no, no podía viajar desde, desde Dallas. Pero eh, ante las opciones de leer su conferencia, él se ofreció a, bueno, pues a que pudiéramos hacer una grabación y que pudieran por lo menos eh, disfrutar de su, de su conferencia. Entonces, eso es lo que, lo que hemos hecho. Se ha grabado un vídeo, está subtitulado, tiene una duración de una media hora aproximadamente y por lo menos nos sirve también para, bueno, pues para tener unas pinceladas de la, de la propuesta que él nos quería, nos quería hacer. Siento, y yo les transmito también en, en su nombre, disculpas por no, por no poder estar aquí en, eh, presencialmente para hacer su conferencia, pero bueno, era, era imposible que, que pudiera viajar. No les voy a leer el currículum porque lo tienen ustedes y simplemente sí que nos parecía clave eh, tener eh, parte de su conferencia dada la, bueno, pues su trayectoria, y su, su interés como investigador en estos aspectos. Y teniendo en cuenta también que él trabaja tanto en el museo, porque fue director del, del Museo de Dallas, como de la universidad. ¿no? Entonces, como de, la exposición para él es un proyecto de investigación y teníamos esas dos eh, visiones. Entonces, nada más, simplemente era, era eso. Hoy, si tienen alguna duda, sobre todo aquellas personas que vayan a solicitar crédito sobre el trabajo, etcétera, pues pueden aprovechar también que estoy yo por aquí y cualquier duda pues me, me preguntan. Muchas gracias. Good afternoon. My name is Rick Bertel, and I'm uh, privileged to speak to you today, not from Madrid, where I ought to be and want to be, but from Dallas, Texas. In back of me is the is a view of the city with the Dallas Museum of Art and the National Sculpture Center and Museum Tower and our new park. And uh, I come to you with great enthusiasm and a talk that's really about travel. So it's not inappropriate that I'm not with you in Madrid. I'm talking to you today about Paul Gauguin, the artist who Paloma's wonderful exhibition introduces you to um, in uh, Madrid, and with an idea that really Paul Gauguin's career and his whole idea of art has an enormous amount to do with travel, with physical travel, with learning about the world. And in fact, one can probably pretty safely say that Paul Gauguin was the first global artist. He was the first artist who made use of his entire knowledge of the globe. And in fact, um, by the time he became an artist, he'd been from the, to the North Pole, he'd been halfway around the world to the other side of South America, he had been into the Middle East, he'd traveled more than any other important French painter or any other important European painter um, before him. And this sense of the global world is something that's very important. And it intersected with his own sense of morality, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, you see in front of you one of his first um, images, one of the first images of Paul Gauguin that we have um, by the hand, not of him, but another artist. And it's going to begin a kind of uh, effort that I'm going to make in looking at Gauguin's self-representations, his self-portraits, in terms of the idea of paradise and of its Christological um, components, which are such an important part, not only of his art, but of this exhibition, which deals with his investigations of the South Seas and of other places. One sees here a, a drawing, actually a, a two drawings on one sheet, which is in the Louvre. And on the left is um, Camille Pizarro's drawing of his pupil and friend, Paul Gauguin. And on the right is Paul Gauguin's drawing of his teacher and friend, Camille Pizarro. And we all know that uh, uh, Gauguin started out his life as an Impressionist. Um, it's a little known phase of his career, but it's always referred to. And in fact, he himself repudiated it. But it's fascinating to see him here because he's shown, shown with an artist who was Jewish, who was born in the New World, 
who was educated in the New World and in France, who'd learned to be an artist in Venezuela um, before settling in France, and who died um, uh, the same year as Gauguin, not even a French citizen. Uh, Pizarro was a Danish citizen. And we see him as a kind of gentle old man smoking his pipe. And next to him is this young, sort of rebellious student in his early 20s. And we see Gauguin um, drawn by the older artist in this very youthful way. And Gauguin, by this time, had decided to be an artist, had begun to practice his art um, very securely, and had done so, again, on the basis of extraordinary travel. Now, his first self-portrait is a painted portrait, which is less than 30 miles from me as I speak to you from Dallas in the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth. And it represents a kind of abject figure, the, the figure of an artist who's in a garret with the, the, the beams um, uh, off, to the, off to the right in his shoulder painting. It's cold. He's all um, uh, uh, covered up in his coat. Um, one has the sense of, of this frigid air. And in fact, he's painting it in a garret in Copenhagen, where he was living and where he was deciding to leave his family and to become an artist. And this portrait of, a, of an abject artist, an artist who's going to become an artist, to choose a profession um, which it was to prove as peripatetic for him as his earlier life had been. This Gauguin was born in Paris, um, was raised in Peru and in Orléans, um, became a member of the Merchant Marines when he was 17 years old, traveled widely, um, was on the other side of the world when his mother died. His father died when he was less, less than a year old. And so we have a kind of parentless artist with a wife and children who has traveled widely and will begin, begin another series of journeys. Now, this exhibition focuses on the concept of paradise, and at least my essay in the catalog focuses on that concept because it's very important to remember that when Gauguin arrived in Tahiti in 1891, um, as a man in middle age, as a man who'd abandoned his wife and children, as a man who'd been a reasonably, though not completely successful artist, he came there, he came to this kind of paradise on earth, if you will, um, with a very freighted idea of paradise. And, that, and the, the full freighting is um, shown very clearly here in a little painting he painted on cardboard before he went to Tahiti. And it represents Eve in the Garden of Eden, as we see. And she's about to pluck something. This looks like a flower rather than a fruit um, from the Tree of Knowledge. And she is in this undeniably paradisical place um, with the palm trees and extraordinary vegetation that we associate with Gauguin's later work in Tahiti. But we have to remember this was made before he even saw Tahiti. Well, who is this Eve? And what does this Eve teach us about Gauguin? Well, first of all, is she really Eve? When we look at her body, we see that her body derives not from Christian iconography and not from any representation of Eve in the Western tradition, but from the figure of the young Buddha in the stupa of Bora Badur on the island of Java, which he owned a photograph of. The photograph is on the upper right of, this, of the screen now. And a better photograph of it is down below so that you can actually uh, trace his, um, the, the source of this figure of Eve. So his Eve is a male figure taken from a stupa that represents Buddha on the distant isle of Java. So already we're in something odd. And then when you look even more carefully, you see that she has this young, um, the, a face of a young woman. And if you look at what we now see juxtaposed against that young woman, it's a photograph of another young woman who happens to be Gauguin's mother a photograph of Gauguin's mother, long dead by the time that this photograph was taken, indeed um, dead for 20, more than 20 years when this photograph was taken. But this photograph of a young woman, the young Madame Gauguin, um, we see here transposed upon the, the body of a male figure. And so already this idea of uh, of a kind of pan, a global world, and a personal world, a world in which his own sense of Christianity, this is definitely Eve, of world religions, this is based on a Javanese things, and of the sense that he, his own identity infects this world. 
It's all the more odd when we know that he also painted this portrait of his mother from this photograph at exactly the same time that he was painting her as Eve. And so rethinking his own paternity, his own mother, his own relationship to Christianity at this moment just before he goes to the South Seas for the first time. And when we see a photograph of his mother that, that he used as the basis for the Eve, um, with a lithographic reproduction of a portrait of his grandmother, her mother, who was the wonderful uh, a French feminist named Flora Tristan, who wrote an extraordinary book called Peregrinations of a Pariah about her own search for identity in Peru and the ways in which she found herself and her parentage, one finds a kind of overlaid iconography of personal, global, and Catholic in an image compressed with such startling power that we have to understand that when Gauguin himself finds a paradisical place, he carries this weight with him. And we can see how far he carries it when he paints this glorious portrait of his mistress Bahura, um, his first of several um, Polynesian mistresses, who we see here as Eve, her face replacing, her head replacing the head of his mother in this world which is based not so much on Borobudur but on Tahiti itself um, with this chimera, this extraordinary lizard that's flying towards her. Again, a compression of many mythological systems in one image. Gauguin's Tahiti was anything but a simple paradise about sex and lack of money and simplicity of life. We see this as well in an earlier self-portrait, um, this one made to send to his friend Vincent. And we see in the lower right-hand corner the dedication, Les Miserables, the, the great um, novel by Victor Hugo, A l'ami Vincent, to my friend Vincent, um, Paul Gauguin, 1888. And one sees Gauguin representing himself again, not as himself, but as Jean Valjean, um, the hero of Victor Hugo's great novel, Les Miserables, and this sense of, again, freighted identities being a part of Gauguin's own sense of self. And we see it again in this extraordinary portrait from Russia, in which one sees Gauguin sort of stained into the canvas. He's looking at us, and we see behind him a kind of white form and a red form and a yellow form that is, in fact, a painting on the wall behind him in a yellow frame. And that painting now at the Cleveland Museum represents Ondine, the nude who throws herself into the water, losing her identity um, to the water and her life to the water behind this artist. And when we also know that Gauguin was fascinated at this period of time by the recently thought of and rediscovered Shroud of Turin, one can see that he's staining his face into canvas, very much the way that the face of Christ left its mark on the shroud around him in Turin. So again, this sense of freighting, of very complicated and difficult and polyvalent meanings that we see. We see him here again before he goes to Tahiti, and we see him in juxtaposition. He's, here he's wearing a blue blouson, uh, the blouson of a painter, though he has no implements of his trade. And we see him juxtaposed to two things on his uh, right or on the, on the, in the left of the painting um, is the famous uh, yellow Christ in the Albright Knox Gallery. Um, in up, upstate New York, and it represents painting and it re represents Christ. On his right is a vase, which we also know from um, his thing, in which he also made, is a representation of him, another self-portrait, but this time a self-portrait as an abject man who is forced into the fires of hell to suffer. And this, the ideas of all of this, of Christ being um, sacrificed for mankind, of Gauguin creating himself as a, as a ceramic image and putting himself into the fire to suffer um, the tribulations of hell, and then this painter looking at us, one can 
see that one is dealing with an artist who is anything but simple. And one sees that again in this self-portrait and in another extraordinary self-portrait um, which derives from his early years in Peru when he saw many of those jugs, pre-Columbian jugs, in the, in the shape of heads. And Gauguin represents himself with blood pouring forth from the top in this extraordinary self-portrait um, in the Ceramic Museum or the Museum of Decorative Arts in, in um, Copenhagen. One sees that the Gauguin who arrives in Tahiti in 1891 is a complicated Gauguin. One sees it again when we look at this reconstruction of a room which he decorated with his friends and admirers in a little inn in Le Poldu um, in Brittany in France where he lived for a while and painted the local people and landscapes. And one sees the room as it was decorated by these artists who, who use their talents as decorators as a way to pay um, for their stay in the room. And this this is the dining room in which they all ate. And in this room are two self-portraits by Gauguin. And I'm going to talk about one, the one on the door to the right of the fireplace. And you see it here, and it represents Gauguin with his famous, he called it a Peruvian or pre-Columbian or savage nose. And we see him holding a little snake with a, a, his tongue hanging out, of course, and beneath the apples of Eve. And so Gauguin is painting himself in a way that suggests his own association with the Eve that he was to paint the next year um, before his trip to um, Tahiti. He um, shows himself with a halo, so he suggests that he's divinized in a Christian way. And this highly complex um, self-portrait is paired with one of his friend with whom he shared um, the inn at Le Poldu, uh, an artist named Meyer de Haan, who was a Dutch Jewish artist who was extremely well read and was very friendly to Gauguin, was a kind of professor to Gauguin in the realm of theology. And one sees here Meyer de Haan oddly sort of sucking his hand with his hand in his mouth, very strange thing, with the apples that are associated with the apples in the portrait of Gauguin, and two books on the table, Sartre Resartus by Thomas Carlyle, a book about the moral effects of clothing, again associated with what we wear but when we cover ourselves after the fall. And then the other book, you'll see that the, the bright yellow one has the word perdu and the word Milton written on it. And it's, of course, a translation into French of Paradise Lost, Paradis Perdu by Milton. And so even here, Paradise, the Garden of Eden, the Fall of Man are associated in two paintings that were conceived on two flanking doors as part of a pair. So the Old Testament image of the Garden of Eden and the Fall of Man and its uh, continuation into Christianity is obsessive to Gauguin before he arrives in um, Tahiti, and it's so excessive that he actually represents himself in this extraordinary painting in the Norton Gallery in Palm Beach, Florida, um, West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, he represents himself as Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, sitting alone, um, with the soldiers coming in in the back and a red-headed artist who is probably Vincent van Gogh leading them to him. And this, this idea, this image is so bizarre and again so heavily laden that we have to realize that what's in Gauguin's head when he seeks to find paradise on earth is already the fall of man. Now, this image was shown, uh, he was very proud of it, and there's a wonderful drawing of it in this letter um, to Bernard, which he wrote, and he illustrated it, and one sees the painting in the lower right corner, um, juxtaposed to a sculpture, um, which is now in the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, and which is another panel dealing with the fall of man. It's titled, Soyez amoureuse, Soyez amoureuse vous serez heureuse. Be loving, and you will be happy. So one thinks of that in terms of the, of the sort of paradisical images at the end of life, when one goes into paradise where there's no guilt or shame, where one is loving with everyone one wants and one will be happy, but then one looks at the relief on which these words are printed. And that relief shows us a, a woman who is uh, b bound, binding herself in a strange way. Her arm, her hand is being um, held below or to pull her above. And one sees to the right of Soye Amoureuse another 
self-portrait of an abject and eyes closed Gauguin who enters this paradoxical realm. The notion of this realm infected by guilt, infected by notions, Judeo-Christian notions of guilt and the fall of man is something which is so essentially a part of Gauguin's imagination that we can't forget it. Now, Gauguin painted himself after he was in Tahiti, um, both when he returned to France in 1894-95 and also when he returns again to Tahiti. But none of those images are quite as freighted with um, uh, th this early material as um, the, the ones before. And I I'm going to show you, I'm going to end this little short talk with two cell portraits. This is one which is actually one of the most humble cell portraits and one of the least freighted cell portraits in Gauguin's oeuvre, and it represents him as a patient in the hospital, recuperating from one of his many d diseases. Gauguin had, um, by this point, tertiary syphilis and was su suffering from many of the ill effects of it, which are known to us today, um, and they were known even better in the 19th century before penicillin cured the disease. And one sees him with his little glasses. Even his eyes have to be aided with another device. And we see him simply in his hospital things, looking at us almost pleadingly. But the most extraordinary of the late cell portraits are found in other places. Here is one of his last books about Christianity, Catholicism, and modern life. It's a manuscript which is now in the St. Louis Art Museum, and it's called The Modern Spirit and Catholicism. And on the front cover, one sees young, beautiful virgins and a man coming in carrying fruit. And on the back cover, one sees an image of women seated with angels in the foreground, and in the left corner, an image of the artist representing them, the artist about to enter paradise and the paradise described in the remarkable and as yet unpublished book by Gauguin. This manuscript has never been published. It's one of the few great texts um, by an important Western artist that, that, is, that essentially sits in a museum vault rather than is read by people in the world today. And you can see that Gauguin is thinking about future, the paradise, not of the garden of evil, the paradise from which one falls, but the paradise that one will enter after death, and wondering about his own position in that paradise as he represents it in this book. He also begins to think of himself as the opposite of the uh, of the the of Christ of the fallen one or the or Lucifer or the devil in this extraordinary representation which one sees on the on the left which is in the Getty Museum representing that devil and on the right one sees this figure f derived from the same uh, uh, representation um, with a young Polynesian woman and again this sense of menace and of guilt and of this world which is, which, is, which is not something to be enjoyed, but something to be enjoyed with the full knowledge that that enjoyment is something fleeting and that it too will die as we die. And then Gauguin's own sense of what that death will bring is something which he deals with in this remarkable self-portrait in Sao Paulo in Brazil in which he represents himself again in a hospital gown, um, showing himself as a rather big man looking at us. And if we look carefully behind the depths and the darkness behind this self-portrait, you see the cross on the upper, in the upper left corner, which is bearing Christ. And of course, all of us who have read the Gospels know that at the moment of Christ's death, the earth goes black and all light goes out of the world. And so that is the moment that is represented in this self-portrait at Gethsemane, his, his, or at Golgotha, this idea of being there, being a witness to the death of Christ. And then behind him, one f sees these ghostly faces um, which come both from Tahiti and from those extraordinary Catholic um, sculptures, the Calvary sculptures in Brittany. And again, here he is in Tahiti. He's representing himself at this time when he's returned to Tahiti. And he's thinking not about that glorious paradisical world in which he lives, 
but about the death of Christ and about the Calvaries um, of, the, of the peoples of Brittany that he had seen earlier in his life. One ends with this first, and not the last, but the last really freighted and charged self-portrait of his career. The first where he sort of comes out as an artist, where I am an artist, but I am alone, I am cold, and I am abject. And in the last self-portrait, the last great self-portrait in Sao Paulo, one sees him at the moment of the death of Christ with the memories of his own peregrinations, and they haunt him as he sits in Tahiti in a room painting a portrait of himself in a world with palm trees and frangipani and fruits and wonderful odors and scents, this world of the sensual world of paradise, which is the world we normally associate with Gauguin with all simplicity. For Gauguin, that simplicity was arrived at after a good deal of suffering. Thank you.